Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is cleaning up the shade garden and dividing hostas. We have a visit from last winter to a unique hydroponics nursery. Casey prunes our dogwood shrubs. And Barbara Brown has a tasty recipe for your morel mushrooms. questions that I so often get asked about is when to divide my hostas. And a general rule for herbaceous perennials is if your plants bloom in the spring, you divide them in the fall. If they bloom in the fall, you divide them in the spring. And if they bloom in the summer, no, you don't divide them in the winter time. You can divide them either in the spring or the fall. And since hostas bloom in the summertime, we can choose whether we want to divide them in the spring or the fall. Now typically the fall is the best time because you're not going to cut up this plant and then push it into the heat of the summer. But a lot of times we get excited as gardeners and we want to go ahead and start dividing and, and propagating our plants. Perhaps you might have bought one at the nursery like this five gallon one that's a pretty big one and want to stretch your dollar a little bit further. Well you can still divide this in the springtime and go ahead and plant it. So we've got one here. This is a Halcyon cultivar. And this is an old cultivar, but a goodie. Um, it has this blue foliage to it, and it's really a textured um, ribbed leaf. And actually, it's one of the cultivars that will hold the blue foliage a little bit longer than some of the more uh, other ones that you might see on the market. Now this particular cultivar gets to be about 14 inches, but will almost double in size once it starts blooming with a lilac uh, flower that will reach about 26 inches tall. So we're gonna look at this one. And this one, just last week, it just had little buds coming up and it's already started to leaf out. So this is probably the latest that you would really wanna divide it um, in the springtime. But we're gonna go ahead and take it out of its pot here. Um, and start looking at where we need to make those cuts. Now, it kind of depends on what your objective is with um, dividing a hosta. We're gonna give it a, a gentle pull here to try to get it out. Um, you see it's got a nice root system on it. It's not root bound, um, but just has good roots to it. Right here, we can look through there and almost see um, that there is a nice division between some of these plants, some of these crowns. So we're gonna cut through that. Now again, typically the nice thing about doing it in the spring before it's got too much foliage is it allows you to kind of see where to divide that plant better so than in the fall when it's completely leafed out. So we're gonna just use our hand saw and cut right through this. It's almost like dividing uh, ornamental grasses, um, just basically cutting it through division. So I'm going to take our saw and just cut right through here. So we've got it divided in half now. But looking at this, I think I can go ahead and divide it uh, into a third by cutting it right in between here. Now really, hostas don't need division a lot. Um, this cultivar, again, is actually a fairly sizable clump, um, and it'll take some time to regrow this good-sized clump. It's a, a fairly slow-growing cultivar. So you want to keep that in mind. We're cutting this knowing that it's going to take some time to reestablish these large clumps. But again, we're going to have three clumps now to work with to put in our garden. So before you attack a hosta, you want to think about how many you want to get out of it. Again, we could divide this even further if we wanted to get more. But for this, for our purpose here, we're just going to take these three 
sizable clumps, yet smaller, and we'll be able to grow three larger clumps eventually. As you approach dividing your hosta, you want to think about how many you might want to get out of it. Because um, again, we've only got three plants here. You could divide this more, but every time you divide it, you're reducing the amount of leaf and also root volume. And as you do that, that means it's going to take longer for each one of those individual plants to grow back and to become that large clump. Now, as you do this, you can also think about whether you want several plants to scatter around your garden or you want to create that bold look of one big hosta plot. If you want that bold look, but you've divided your hosta, something you might consider doing is spacing them appropriately, but spacing them together. So here we've got three of the same uh, cultivar. And if we plant them about two feet apart, we're going to have a nice patch of this Halcyon hosta right here in a couple of years. Most hostas don't need dividing that often. In fact, if you've noticed that it's been growing pretty well for several years, um, you can leave it if you would like. You can divide it if you want uh, more plants to share around your garden or share with friends. But also you might look at the foliage and if it starts to decline on the inside, um, you might think about dividing it. Here we've got a good plot of a hosta so we're going to dig this up and go ahead and divide it. Now when you're digging hostas, you want to make sure that you're not digging right close to the crown of the plant. We're going to dig a little bit further away, depending on how big, but maybe five or six inches away from the crown of that plant so that we can ensure that we're getting a large root ball to divide. So this hosta, you can see as I dug up that huge clump, it actually kind of broke into three separate clumps as I was pulling it up out of the ground. And so it kind of makes me think that maybe it was like what we were talking about earlier, how they planted three plants close together to create that large clump. Now, of course, these are sizable individual clumps, three clumps. So we're gonna go ahead and divide this up even further. You can see in some situations where they naturally have broken apart and you can almost just go ahead and separate those with your hand and have a nice plant there to use somewhere. You can see we've got some smaller eyes coming on here. But in a situation like this, if you've got your spade out, you don't need to go find a hand saw. You can actually just use your spade to divide that plant. So you can see we've taken what was one plant that covered about a square foot of maybe three feet. We've divided that into eight separate plants now that we can either scatter throughout our garden or make an even larger clump of this guacamole hosta. Remember, hostas are easy to divide like ornamental grasses. You just go in there and cut them apart. They're pretty tough plants and it's a great way to get multiple plants out of one. Today we are here and joined by Don Blim, who is a vegetable and uh, lettuce grower, I should say. You're, the, you're known as the lettuce man, is that it's, correct? The lettuce man, yeah. <laughs> And we're in his hoop houses and we're going to talk to him today about season extension with hoop houses. So Don, tell me a little bit about your progression, how you got into growing vegetables. Well, when I first started, I started growing outside just on the bare soil. Found that weeding wasn't really what I went into gardening for. Uh-huh. Uh, so I switched over to the plastic culture, started growing, still growing outside, but the wind was just too much of a problem for me. Okay. So I decided to put up some hoop houses or high tunnels and growing inside. Uh, I can control my temperatures, I can control my wind, I can control the moistures that, that I use. And with any type of farming, you're trying to do some risk management, basically. Yes. And so we all know in Oklahoma, one day can be one temperature and the next day can be completely different. Completely so different. Do hoop houses sort of uh, slow down that process as far as, uh, or moderate, I should say, the weather and things for you? Yes. Uh, I don't have to water as often. In hydroponic systems, you, you use far less water. So you're, you're moving more towards hydroponics. Let's talk a little bit about that. What, what's made that transition just from growing in a traditional soil under a hoop house to hydroponics? 
Well, with the hydroponics, you don't have near the, the pest problems. Uh, the hydroponic systems take about 5% of, of the water that uh, growing outside does. Because you're not constantly watering yeah. every day? Water's not going up in the air. It's not going down in the soil. It's just a far better system for me because of the control that I can use on my plants. So you've got a lot of plants here growing in this hydroponic bed. Tell me a little bit, how many plants do we have here? This bed will hold 5,120 plants. Wow. It takes about six weeks from the time we plant them on this end to the time they get down to the far end to be harvested. Okay. And I takes, love that. You've kind of created a, a factory line that the harvestable plants are actually coming to you down there. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we start our plants in, in, a, in the oasis cubes down here, and then they're brought down to this end where they're put into the, on, on our boards, put okay. into cups. And these ladies are doing that These right two now, ladies please. right here, are Eva and Debbie, and they're the, they do all the work and I get all the fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you were saying the Oasis cubes are what you use to plant your seed, and then those are then put into these little cups? Yes, they're put into the cups. And uh, that particular board will hold about 300 plants. Wow. The smaller boards out here is where they're, where they're actually finished off at. They'll, yeah. they'll hold 64 plants. So you'll actually change them from those they'll boards from, into the next size yes. boards? Yes, yeah, okay. it's time to move them and we, we're not finished with a new bed that we're getting ready to put in. Okay, so you're still trying to obviously be as efficient with your space usage as possible. Yes. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what the depth of the water and the nutrients and that sort of stuff, if you could, please. The, uh, the water itself, this, this bed has about three inches of water in it. And uh, it, it, it's just a floating, floating bed is what they call them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I use a water soluble, soluble nutrient. Uh, Jax is, a, is one brand that I use. Uh -huh. You just, you have it, there's a tool that we, we measure all the nutrients that are necessary that, to go in this, these beds. I have a mixing tank over here that I mix prior to, to putting in the bed so that I can read what I've actually mixed up, make sure it's right. The lettuce beds have to be at one nutrient level. My celery and basils, they have to be at a different nutrient level. That's why there's different different beds. Okay, so you can grow different so crops. So we can grow different crops. Now, what causes the uh, agitation for that nutrients in the bed? Do you have any way of moving that water around in here? Yeah, I have a pump at one end okay. with a hose that runs all the way down. In fact, it's right here. Okay. That, that just keeps the water circulating within, within the bed. All right. Uh, and, and it doesn't get stagnant or anything nope, because of that. Because I mean, of that. We've actually found that there's a couple of even little frogs in here, <laughs> so it's obviously a very healthy system. Yeah. Um, what about any other pests? You know, frogs don't eat much lettuce. <laughs> you fortunately don't have to deal with rabbits in here, but are there any other pests that you have as problems? Well, we have some gnat problems, not, not a lot. We also have a, a, a bug netting that I use on the outside so okay. we can keep the bugs out. And then if they do get inside, I'll, you can see some little yellow tags down through here. Uh -huh. And it's just a sticky tag so that the bug will get on there. That way I don't have to use a pesticide inside okay. of the plant okay. or the house. I also use some, I call them bait plants, that they like the, that plant better than they like the lettuce plant. That way I can, I can identify my, my, my problems prior to becoming a real problem. So they're kind of like trap plants yes. that you, or bait indicator plant. plants, yeah, <laughs> bait plants. And, and one of those is arugula, is that what I understand? Ar arugula is one that they, they, they love the arugula prior to getting to the lettuce. Okay. And we grew some arugula in here and we've moved it out because of that problem. Okay. We've gone into another another building and we're growing it more in a, in a growing medium rather, rather than in hydroponically. Do you find that certain plants do well uh, in hydroponics versus the other or vice versa? Yes, I, you, can, you, you can grow anything hydroponically. Okay. But there are some that just simply do better. I grow celery. Mm -hmm. hydroponically, and that seems to work extremely well. Well, the fact the that you're growing celery at all in Oklahoma <laughs> is kind of impressive. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a lot of that being grown in Oklahoma. Very good, very good. Well, it's a beautiful plant. I mean, it, it looks like it looks like parsley on steroids, actually, <laughs> but it's, it's obviously... And it has a whole different flavor yeah. because of the nutrients that you're putting into it. And I, and I think most people wouldn't recognize how green your celery yes, is versus yeah. what we traditionally would buy. It is, it is completely different than what you buy in a, in a grocery store. It's, it's beautiful. So the end product, tell us a little bit about where you're taking your products um, and, and what the customer actually receives as far as this lettuce. Well, I, I sell in restaurants. I have two, two restaurants in Oklahoma City. One of them's called 21C and the other one's Oklahoma. And they buy my lettuce and, and 
they've actually told me that their customer base has increased because of my lettuce. Uh, they, they, they've, they've gone from 75 head to 255 head last week. So uh, they like the flavor because there is an actual flavor. It's not just lettuce. Mm -hmm. And they love the color. It has way more color than, the, than the, the, what you're buying in the stores. And what about, for lack of better words, the shelf life of your lettuce versus other lettuce that might be bought? I, I actually sell what we call a living lettuce. Okay or a living plant because the root system is still left on it. And it can last up to four weeks for keeping the refrigerator and keep some water in it. And the main thing is it stays fresh. I tell everybody it shouldn't last more than four days. They need to be eating it by then. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the things that so many people, especially as far as produce goes, lettuce is the one that fades the fastest, yes. it seems like, when you buy it. Yes, it is. And, and yours will last up to potentially four weeks. That's yes. incredible. Yeah. And I also want to mention, Don, you are the president, uh, is that correct, That's of the correct. Fruit and Vegetable Association? Oklahoma Fruit and Vegetable Association. Yeah. So if, if people want more information or they're interested in getting into this, can they contact you guys? Yeah. You can just go to our website and log in there and just, just you know, ask whatever questions you'd like to ask. And, we also have a Facebook page that they're welcome to go to. Okay, that's one thing I found in this community is everybody's so willing to share information and their knowledge, and you guys have obviously learned a lot through yeah. this process. So um, one last thing, where can people find your fresh lettuce this spring? Well, I sell it at uh, Urban Agrarian. Uh, it's also, also go to the uh, uh, Klein Street Farmer's Market in downtown Oklahoma City. Excellent. And then also sell it to Edmund Markets. All right, well, we'll be looking for you there. Thank All you right. so much, Don. Thank you. Nice. Today we're going to be looking at pruning our red twig dogwoods. Now red twig dogwoods are known for their red bark that you see appear in the winter time, but they're a really great plant to have in the Oklahoma garden year round. This particular one is called Garden Glow, and so it actually has more of a lime green foliage to it that will start to present itself in the summertime. Now, like other red twig dogwoods, it does have a white flower that will produce in the springtime. And then, as I mentioned, the lime green foliage in the summer, which will then eventually turn to your uh, traditional fall colors in the fall time. So it really has year-round interest to it. And when I talk about red twig dogwoods and how to prune them, you would treat your yellow twig dogwoods the same way. They're very similar. Um, just one has yellow twigs and the other has red twigs. So on this particular one we're looking at, you can see that there are brown twigs uh, in this with also the red twigs. Now the red twigs are the newer growth and the brown twigs, as the twigs get older or the branches get older, they produce that more traditional bark on them and really begin to lose that red color that we're after for that fall winter attraction. So what you wanna do when you're pruning this is to go in as low as you can to the base of that plant and prune out any of the older branches. These older branches, again, are the ones that have the kind of the dull brown bark to them. Most red twig dogwoods do well in full sun. Now, because this one has a lime green foliage to it, it will scorch a little bit in full sun. So this particular one called Garden Glow actually likes a little bit of shade on it. Now, they also prefer traditional average soil. So they really are well adapted to a range of soils. If they had their preference though, it would be moist, well-drained, slightly acidic soil. Now you're gonna to wanna to go in and prune this either once a year or once every couple of years to again take out that old growth, those brown branches. Um, if you haven't done this in a while, you might notice that you have several brown branches in there that you're gonna to wanna to remove. And in that situation, what you might do is just take maybe a third of them out the first year. So, cause every time you cut out branches, you're gonna be losing some of that foliage growth, that canopy growth also. So you don't wanna to take too much of that growth out of the canopy um, during that first year of pruning. Again, that's on a shrub that you haven't pruned in several years. But in order to rejuvenate it, take about a third of those old branches out. The following year, take another third, so on and so forth. And eventually you'll have all of your growth being fresh and new and have that bright, vibrant color.
today we're going to cook with morels. Now, they are a fabulous wild mushroom that you can forage for in Oklahoma, but you've got to know what you're doing. And you also need to know whether or not you have any allergy to them before you try to eat them. But what you do need to do is make sure you clean them well. So that's where I've started here. First of all, I brush the mushrooms with a soft cloth or uh, because they're so uh, full of, of crevices and crooks and crannies you really can't use a mushroom brush you don't want to peel them but you do need to try and get them clean and as you can see it's going to be real difficult to do so i cut them in half because sometimes you'll see a lot of insects in here i've talked to people who have found slugs in there uh, and so you want to get those out so uh, the way we do that uh, is we use two or three uh, changes of salted water now you notice i'm only using a small amount of salt it doesn't take a lot uh, to desiccate the insect and pull them out. And then you're going to pour cold water over them. And you're going to let them sit for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Now this also will remove any dirt that you uh, didn't notice. We want to keep them submerged, however. So what I usually do is take a paper cloth, a paper towel, and just put that over the top. And that will keep the top of them moist uh, and wet as this goes along. You're going to do that for 10 to 15 minutes, you're going to change the water, kind of rinse them off a little bit, repeat uh, twice so that they get a total of 45 minutes soaking. Once you've gone through three times with the salt water, make sure you drain them as well as you can. I've got a 12 inch skillet here and to that I'm going to add a tablespoon of vegetable oil, either canola or olive oil are good choices, and then also two tablespoons of salted or unsalted butter. If you use salted butter, you can add a little bit less salt later on, uh, which is the way I'm going to do it because I just didn't have any of the other type here today. Okay, this is going good. You don't have to wait until the butter is completely melted, but do keep an eye on the butter because it will burn uh, on you. So uh, to that, I'm going to add about a half a cup of shallots and you could use uh, onions. It just needs to be kind of a rough chop. It doesn't have to be finely diced by any means. And we're going to let that just cook for about a minute. And then we're going to start adding some of these other ingredients to it. Okay, I started with eight ounces of morels. And we're going to add those to the pan. What I'm doing is morels with peas and shallots. I don't think I, I told you what I was doing besides working with morels. So we're going to add the morels to the skillet. And then I'm going to add three different kinds of peas. I have snow peas, sugar snap peas, and English peas or sweet peas. I'm not going to add quite all of them to the skillet because I don't think they're quite all going to fit. Uh, but it's uh, eight ounces of each of these and then a cup of the, the regular peas. These I wanted to use fresh. You could use frozen. So we're going to let these cook for about two minutes and we're going to add the English peas or the sweet peas um, and after that period of time because they won't take quite as long for cooking. And I'm going to add a cup of just regular peas. Now these if, uh, frozen peas will do fine, but go ahead and thaw them before you add them so that you don't uh, change the temperature too much. You want these to continue to cook. Morels do need to be cooked before you eat them. Whether they are frozen or dried, you need to make sure you come back and uh, make sure they're cooked when you're ready to go. If you do find that you're fortunate and you find a whole lot of them, you can freeze them, but they do need to be blanched before you uh, put them in the freezer. Uh, and you can do that the same way you blanch other mushrooms, and you can find that information on the National Center for Home Food Preservation website. It won't be specific to morels, but it will tell you how to uh, prepare mushrooms for the freezer. If you don't do that, what tends to happen is they uh, tend to get bitter. Uh, and they don't keep as long. So uh, those are some things you want to watch out for. Now you can tell these are starting to be ready. You just want to cook this until the uh, morels are tender. So you can take one out and slice it if you choose. Uh, but these are probably about ready. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this, turn off the heat. Uh, and we've got a couple of more ingredients so that you can stir into this. I've got uh, somewhere between uh, half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of kosher salt. And I would taste them to see how much this is going to need. And then also, I don't like to add a lot of other flavors that are going to cover the flavor of the morel uh, because it is so special. Uh, but I am going to add a little bit, maybe a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of lemon zest. Uh, this is uh, basically all there is to this one. Uh, it is uh, fairly easy to do. It doesn't take a lot of time once you get the morels clean. 
Cleaning the morels, however, is really important, so that soaking is important, and it's not something you can do ahead of time. It's something you need to do uh, right before you're ready to cook them, or they won't keep as long for you. So if you are fortunate enough to get some morels, I hope you'll give this recipe a try. It's morels with peas and shallots. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Next week, Casey will scratch our trees and small shrubs. We'll plant salsa in a container. OSU turfgrass specialist Dennis Martin will stroll through cool season grasses. And Payne County Extension horticulture educator Keith Reed will slap together an inexpensive way to protect your vegetables from any late frosts. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>